well, this is amazing. I'm not going to lie. I came into to, to, to the building and I thought, wow, like Ashley and the team really did amazing. So can we just give a round of applause to Black Tech Fest in general? Yeah, I think like what the guys have done is amazing. So um, my name is Ivan, Ivan Beckley, um, CEO and co-founder at Subera. And today I just thought, you know, when Ashley asked me to speak, he said, you could do a panel, you can do a talk, you can do basically what you want. And I thought, actually, I'd really enjoy talking about the opportunity to use technology to improve healthcare for, for us um, as black people. Um, and generally, actually, for everyone. Um, and I think I just want to talk through the opportunity and the thing that I see is, is available. So the headline is creating a more equitable and inclusion, inclusive healthcare system. Um, and uh, I'm going to walk you through some of the, my, my thoughts. So the first thing is that happiness lies first of all in health. And I found this and I thought it was such a great way to start, which is that this topic is about the thing that's really important to us, which is our health. Um, health is life um, and health enables life. Um, but healthcare is not the same for everyone. Uh, and I think a lot of us will have experienced friends or family or people who have had to in that interact with the healthcare system but it's not been what they expected. So what does equity mean? Equity is the quality of being fair and just. It means basically enabling an environment where people will have equal or equitable access to something. So a great way to describe it is like, if I'm quite tall, if you wanna be able to see above say a bush, you can't give me the same ladder as someone who's a lot shorter. Now that would be being equal, but equity is giving that person a different ladder to be able to see. Inclusion, the act of making a person or a thing part of a group. So, how many of you all feel part of this group right now? Raise your hand, right? It's an inclusive environment where you feel like you're part of something, you're part of people. Um, now the question is, do, do these two words describe healthcare today? Raise your hand if you think that's, that's the case. Which is extremely sad because we all, every single one of you here, have to interact with the system in some way. And so if you don't feel like it's fair and just and inclusive, what is it there for? So um, these are some early statistics that I just wanted to pull up, right? And you can read them. Um, women with dementia were found to be a particular risk of staying on antipsychotics medication for longer compared to men. Men in the most deprived areas were 3.6 times more likely to die from an avoidable cause of death and reducing their life expectancy by up to nine years. So this is in more deprived areas compared to more affluent. And one in seven LGBT people avoid seeking care because of fear of discrimination. So I'm gonna start here and these are individuals and groups of people that, you know, the healthcare system for some time has been set up not to, to be able to support. But black people, our people, actually have it worse off than anyone else. Black women are five times more likely to die in pregnancy and childbirth than their white counterparts. Black people are four times more likely to be detained under the Mental Health Act. And for African Americans, I tried desperately to find a statistic for the UK, I just couldn't find it. But for African Americans, skin cancer, five year survival is 24% lower. So, these are some horrific statistics, and this wouldn't be acceptable in any other environment. So why do we accept it in healthcare? I'm gonna start, I'm gonna kinda go back to the beginning and tell you a bit more about me. So I'm the CEO and co-founder at Civera. I studied medicine at UCL, um, and I was there for six years. I didn't do a master's in data science, and the whole point of that was, I kind of saw an opportunity where healthcare needed to be better than what it was today. You know, you're trained to be in the system, support patients and look after them. But when you're in, the, in that interaction, you see people and you see actually how different their care is, you wonder something has to be different. And so for me, to, I lean into, into technology. So I actually did a master's in data science, which was sponsored by DeepMind, so the team that's here. Um, I was the first medical student to, to, to work at the company. And, and there you could see that they were building the future. And, and actually they used their minds and technology in order to change what had been built before. Um, and so my journey is kind of using that and using that experience to really transform the way in which people experience what is so important to us. Um, and that has led kind of in a number of ways, but this is a really combination that I think that's amazing in that, you know, I was approached by Audible team to, to do a podcast, which they've never done, never done before. 
<clears throat> it was fully commissioned, and it was a five-part series on covering bias in the healthcare system. So it's fully available. Um, it's now award two national awards, um, the best British podcast documentary, um, and Amnesty International raised us the best podcast. So this is, thank you guys, appreciate it. Um, and, and we started this during the pandemic. It was, we didn't expect to win these awards, but really what it spoke to was actually these stories, the stories of these people are not being, of our people are not being told. And so we followed five patients in each series who talk about actually their experiences in having, you know, to, to interact with doctors who didn't understand what their skin color or presentations of, of disease was on their skin color or interacting with, with doctors or midwives who didn't believe that they had pain. And all of those stories we told in a narrative of how did we get here and how did we end up in this situation? But more importantly, how do we move forward? And I'm gonna give a shout out to Malone McCrende, who's, who's also a medical student. He was featured in the podcast for his work already um, in um, black, brown skin. So check out his work also. So give me a shout out, Malone. Um, cool, okay. So, so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna transition, right? So this doesn't have to be this way. The way that it currently is doesn't have to be the case. So how did we get there and how do we move forward? This is society in 1891. This is society in 2022. This is medicine in 1891. This is medicine in 2022. Medicine has not changed as much as society. That's the problem. Um, and so the reason why I'm stood here and the reason why I do what I do is to change medicine so that it serves the purpose of what we need today. So medicine was built by those that had power. Their ideas define how healthcare is today. Um, these are all clinicians who influenced healthcare dramatically, but in a way that was negative to black people. So James Sims, he was a surgeon, a doctor in the South, in America. And actually his story, he's, he's dubbed the father of gynecology, so women's health. Um, but he systematically operated on black women without their consent. These were typically safes. Um, as a way of kind of testing his procedures and operations. A lot of these procedures and operations still exist today. Um, and actually, a lot of his, he's been recognized throughout the world for his work. And then Samuel Cartwright, he's also a doctor in the South. He was a plantation, plantation owner. Um, and he actually um, was the first one to use a spirometer to measure lung capacity in black people. Um, and this spirometer showed that apparently black people have long, lower lung capacity. And so the device he used then had a correction, race correction, which meant that um, when you use this device, there's a button that has race or, or, or black people on it, something of that, of that ilk, um, and actually corrects lung capacity for that. It's, it's, it's been removed from many devices, but still exists. Um, and then Raymond, I'm not gonna pronounce his last name because I don't know how to. Um, this guy, he was a director of disease prevention in, in America, um, the Center for Disease Prevention in America. Um, and he led the Tuxedi experiments. I don't know how many of you know that. Well, basically, they injected syphilis in black men without their consent in order to see the natural progression over eight years. This happened across 40 years, and more than 100 people died. Um, it was eventually found out by a journalist, so not even the government closed it down. So, so medicine was built by these individuals, and actually what that means is that healthcare has, has transplanted some of those learnings and that information to where we are today. But we fix inequalities in healthcare by changing who has power to, to change care. Um, so the people, who is in the seat to make change for care? So this is Toying. I know Toying because she is the CEO and co-founder at CityBlock, and she's been very helpful in my journey. CityBlock is a 5.7 billion valued company in America, manages thousands of people who are low income, and need better healthcare. She actually studied medicine at King's College. Um, so she's an amazing individual that I've looked up to and has, is actively changing the way we deliver care. Um, knowledge, so this is a, a, a recent, relatively recent paper where an algorithm was built to detect actually that the pain that people were describing, specifically black people, was actually real. Um, but doctors couldn't see it because of the way that they were operating. And so this technology was able to identify something that we couldn't see physically or we didn't believe in people, um, which for me is phenomenal, right? And, and then this is a, a screenshot of an application from Sporo Health, which is again a company in America which is focused on healthcare for people of color. Um, so for me, we fix the inequalities that currently exist by changing 
who has control over how healthcare is delivered. So technology is the leading power in society today. All these companies are in some way moving towards healthcare, Apple, Google, Amazon, and, and, and Meta. Um, so Severo, what we are, we, we're a virtual care company. So we started about two, two and a half years ago. We manage patients remotely from home and we're contracted by the healthcare system to do so. Um, and we've been growing very fast since. We manage about 20,000 patients across the UK, 40 plus practices, and we're growing. Um, and so what we try to do in order to fix some of these is, is improve access. So we have available outside of hours, both in the morning and evening, because we recognize people actually are working. Shock horror. Um, and actually, this application, we've designed it so that it's very accessible. So we do a lot of accessibility testing, because we realize that that is something that's not been done enough in, the, in the, the kind of tech, health tech space. Integration, so we don't work against your general practice, we work with. Partly because data is a really important part to make sure that we have the right level of care for as many people as possible. Um, and so we're, we're directly integrated with the system. We see all your patient records and we do that in a really secure way. And we think that's an important part of reducing the inequalities in healthcare. Rather than fragmenting care, we're trying to collect together. So intelligence, we build our own dashboard where our clinicians use to manage patients. Now this intelligence, it helps us to really understand how do we mitigate some of the risks that have been built in the system already. And so we build some of our own algorithms that we validate internally to make sure that we're not repeating the mistakes of the previous healthcare system. So I, I'm gonna kind of wrap up in, in this environment, which is to say healthcare was built by those that had power, but with technology, we have power to, to rebuild. So thanks for listening. Uh, I'm really open to, to loads, of, loads of questions. I think there's a, like a roaming. <clears throat> Hello. Oh. Hello. Hi, my name is Yasmin. Um, that was just the most amazing talk. I can't even tell you how good you are at storytelling. <laughs> that was amazing. Okay. So I'm a pharmacist by background, but also have a master's in AI. Mm. I, um, like my passion has been to make healthcare more equ equitable, yeah. but it's so difficult having worked in the NHS in both primary care and secondary care, how unequitable it is, but how much barrier, I guess, the NHS have to tech companies. So I guess my question for you is, I know you said you don't work with GP practices, but yeah. how do you, how did you even enter the space? Yeah. And I guess, is it free at the point of use or how, yeah. Yeah, that. yeah, I mean, our service is completely free to patients because we charge the system. So we have contracts directly with general practices to manage patients from home because we realize that they have more demand than they have people to to deliver care and so but they have a huge they have a lot of money um, and so what we do is that we contract them to manage specific populations so people have blood pressure and diabetes um, and we manage them by making sure they don't go to the practice so our job is to reduce the number of appointments for managing patients um, so your question is how did I get into it basically how do you get into enable enabling it I think um, your approach you're taking is already fantastic, right? You're doing a master's in, in, in AI, you've been a pharmacist in the past, and I think combining the two worlds is really what allows you to make change. So there's a lot of people who study healthcare, work in the system, but the, the act of studying where we've been before, what we've done before, is not gonna move the needle for where we want to be. And so, you know, really understanding how the world is transforming with technology and learning what that looks like and applying it to the space will help to move things forward. Um, and so that's, that was my approach, right? I, I did a master in data science and it didn't have to be a master's, right? I could have studied an online course or I could have really um, found a mentor who was in this space to learn and teach me how to utilize this technology. But really it was an active mindset to say, we can't be following or trying to change the system that wasn't built for the people and how society is today. And so we have to think outside of that box and we need to make sure that that's the approach we take in order to make a difference. So basically what I'm saying is try and find a way to, to have one foot in and one foot out. And I think that will allow you to be the, the, the change that you want to be. Hi. 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 I'm Leanne. Hi, Leanne. Um, I just wondered whether you feel that there's a role that I guess maybe like pharmaceutical companies have to play in 
making healthcare more equitable and how maybe technology can also help them to advance as well. Yeah. I guess there's like the healthcare bit, but then also the development of the drugs and like yeah. how they're tested and stuff as well. So. Yeah. So the question is, what does pharma have to play in, in this? A huge, a huge amount, right? Um, for example, um, we manage blood pressure. Um, and it's notoriously known that there's a pathway for managed blood pressure for people who are black and there's a pathway for everyone else. Um, there's a lot of research to disprove that actually that's not the right pathway. Um, and so the, the reason being why that's been in place is because we've done it many, many years and, and, and we've not revisited how we approach things. So I think the approach that I believe is the best way is definitely in the farmer's perspective is actually having people of influence and power in positions in those companies to say, actually, we're developing drugs, but are we testing it in the right populations? Um, we are really putting forward specific medications for specific populations, but have we consented to understand actually their needs and how effective is it, that treatment for them in their lives? And so what I'm saying is, back to, to the, what I think is the most powerful way to, to make a change is actually either recognizing that we need to change the knowledge or the knowledge base of which we make decisions. Actually, we need to change the people who are making those decisions or we need new technology to help us see things that we don't already see. Um, and I think, uh, for me, I've thought about this quite a lot, but if you think about it in those three ways, in any environment, then that's how we, we make the change we need to, especially in pharma, but in other areas of healthcare system. Yes. Um, first of all, I should say that I'm somewhat uh, slightly biased. I worked with Ivan a little while ago when we interned together at Google. And um, this guy was like a machine. He was, he was a firehouse. Appreciate like, it. follow this guy. Keep a hold of the edge of his garment because this guy's going to do something special. But um, the question is, you know, we, bo we both kind of interned at Google together and yeah. uh, both of us would have seen some of the phenomenal stuff coming out of Go like DeepMind. Yeah. And the, like, I remember like reading about how Google were able to do things like detect uh, issues in like radiology images with far greater like efficiency than radiologists themselves and exactly. then having that kind of AI that could like take a high resolution image of your eye and predict like the excess eye disease. Yeah, yeah. And so I suppose my question is this like um, the, the whole world is moving to this weird space where like data matters. Mm. Uh, some of the best kind of uh, developers of this tech are, are in that private sector space like Google, the Amazon, you know, Amazon's getting into healthcare. Yeah. And so the question is like one, what role do you think um, the kind of future of healthcare ha will play for us as, as a community. Yeah. And the second one is sort of like, how do you feel about that balance between where it's all going in terms of private sector basically yeah, yeah, being yeah. the best at this, yeah, you know, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah, like yeah. public sector roles who are, whose their job it is to kind of provide for everyone, yeah. actually just being way behind everyone else? Yeah, such a good question. Well, thank you, bro. Um, I, I would say on, on the first part, which is kind of the future of healthcare for our people, I, I think. For me, it, the, the mindset is basically just, again, going back to those three part perspectives, is that we need to make sure that the right people are in the leadership positions to make the change. Um, and we need to make sure that actually we are transforming or reforming, I would say, the knowledge that we have, the knowledge base we're working with, because it came from the times of those individuals, right? They were testing on enslaved individuals, right? Black people, and that knowledge is what informed the way healthcare is today. Uh, and so that doesn't reflect society, nor should it ever have happened. Um, and so my thing is about the future happens when we have the right people who have the right intentions in positions of power to make change. Um, in terms of like the, the privatization, you could say, of healthcare and, and how that you know, sits within the public health system and, and not, and you know, does that mean that people are able to afford healthcare if you, know, you have pri big private companies coming to this space? The way I look at it is that true technology in any industry, what it does is democratize. So democratize is a word that's utilized a lot. But really it's saying make something that was previously inaccessible and extremely expensive to something, to someone that, to any, almost anyone. Um, and you can see this in, in all realms. I, I was watching a conversation and there was a founder that said, your phone is not that different. In fact, it probably is the same phone as the world's richest person, so Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk, whoever it is. That's what technology democratization looks like. And so I have high hopes that in healthcare we'll do the same with the right intention of people. Like the likes of Toying and, and Severo, what we're trying to do is very much utilize technology to do what it's meant to do, which is to bring something that was extremely inaccessible down to something people can really utilize. Um, and if you look at the difference between Jeff Bezos and yourself and what they have access to in healthcare, 
we're trying to close that gap. So, so that's, that's kind of how I'd answer it. Thanks. Uh, that, it's really inspiring talk, and it's great to hear about your work. Um, so I'm Miles. I'm an academic at Bristol Medical School, nice. um, and I'm really interested in how you are capturing and exploring whether whether it is doing what it's meant to be doing. Like, right. what, what does the evaluation look like? What are the patient experiences? Yeah. How are you using data to to tap into whether your aspirations for for, for what it's like to be using the platform are, are, are materializing? Yeah. Great question. I mean, again, that goes back to the knowledge piece that I spoke about, which is we need to have people like yourselves who are in, in rooms and environments where saying actually the way we've delivered healthcare doesn't really understand the value proposition for our people, our communities and people of difference. So we really need to look at our evaluation process and we review that whole um, kind of experience. For us, personally at Severa, we focus on really looking at various different parts of people's health journey. So we look at one, how our providers deliver care, so patient satisfaction and quality of care. So our physicians are, are measured by how well people experience care, and they're, they're given bonuses based on that, not on kind of how many medication you prescribe or like how many appointments you did, which is typically the, the kind of the output measures. Then there's like looking at health outcomes. So did we move the needle from when you had high blood pressure to, to lower blood pressure? So we actually measure the time frame between that. So it's crazy for us, 70% of patients come to us with high blood pressure from the system. Right? And so we actually saw a patient who recently was like 200 over 150 blood pressure. The patient went straight to, to, to A&E and actually was admitted because of the, the, the work that we did at Severa. So measuring that kind of out, health outcomes. And then the last thing is, is life outcomes. So actually looking at where are patients when they come to us. So we have a sense that some of the barriers, the biggest barriers to healthcare are social. So do people have the right access to, to um, kind of housing? Or, or work, are they in any employment? We ask those questions and we try to use that as a context to understand people's situations. So it's, it's not easy, um, but we try, try to be holistic because the system isn't. And, and in order to change, we need to do things different. Hi, Evan. Yeah. As we're talking about this. Um, <laughs> so I'm Malone. I'm building a healthcare company specifically for black and brown people, so every single person in this room. Um, my question was around like the talk was about improving outcomes for black people using tech. Mm. Um, typically, we know black and brown communities don't trust healthcare generally. Yeah. Um, so how can we utilize tech to almost rebuild this trust from the ground up? Yeah. I mean, you probably should answer that question, to be honest. But um, what I would say is, like, from my perspective, I think the way to do it is by having authentic leaders in the space behind that technology, right? So people who people can trust, who have an, uh, kind of a direct interest in making sure that this does what it needs to do for the right people, right? That's the first thing. The, the second is that I think doing it in a way that's different is separated, you know, from the system. Like, it's important to be integrated, and we think that you live a bit half outcomes that way. But at the same time, recognizing that this is not... Uh, the NHS. This is not doesn't come with all the baggage that the system has. This is actually a different entity. Um, and also really making yourself, so, so the number one value at Cerrero is that we'll be, we build trust. So we've actually did a research with um, University of Southwark, or no actually, South Bank University, my mistake. Um, and we looked at actually what was blood pressure in the community like. So this is not from the system. So we had commissions, um, but barbershop to, to actually carry out blood pressure reviews. And that was a way of like trying to build trust around healthcare in general, trying to build a trust around a different entity, but also to try and understand that actually in the community is where healthcare should be, not in the hospital, not in the GP practice, it should be in the community. And, uh, and then if you can go closer to that environment, then you build that trust. Cool, I think, Seven, is that it? Okay, you say we'll cut. Okay, thanks everyone. <laughs>